So uh, I want to announce our keynote speaker and introduce him. Uh, Dave Kennedy is the uh, founder of Trusted Sec and in the past has been CISO at uh, Diebold. He's the founder of DerbyCon. Um, you've seen him on uh, all the major news outlets and in front of Congress. Um, and he's here today to talk about uh, his excellent tool, the Social Engineering uh, Toolkit, which I have used on many engagements myself. So everybody give a big hand to Dave Kennedy. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's early. We, uh, last night, we got, definitely got into some shenanigans here in Cincy. I crashed the drone. Um, and uh, I don't know who paints a building black, by the way. Just, and I, I understand we were inebriated a little bit. But uh, anyways, um, it's interesting how B-Side Cincinnati started because it's really the same type of uh, concept we have at DerbyCon. Uh, Adrian Crenshaw had a uh, free Metasploit class in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we went to it, and I presented a Metasploit um, portion of it, and did a lot of stuff on social engineering and stuff like that, and exploit that. And afterwards, we're all sitting at the table, you know, drinking a couple of beers, and uh, with Martin and a few others, and uh, we're like, hey, we should start a conference out here, it'd be really cool. And, um, you know, the whole 4 Street library in Louisville is really neat, and it's just kind of like a self-contained ecosystem. And uh, so we're like, hey, we'll start a conference. And uh, we kind of went all in the first year, and we're like, well, if you get three or 400 people, we can break even. And uh, so we ended up getting a, like 1,300 the first year or something like that. So it ended up going really well, and it's, you know, it's 2,000 last year. We actually shrunk it this year a little bit down to about 1,800. It was a little too packed like, uh, this last year. Um, but it's how that stuff starts. I mean, you know, you get together, you, you figure out how, what do you want to do, and I mean, it's wrong. Oh, I think I have it on mute. Yeah. How about now? Hey. Hey. Yeah. Amazing technology, I'm sorry. Yeah, don't, just don't mute it. <laughs> I just muted it again. Uh, anyways. So it's funny because these, these, these community things really work. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in doing stuff like this, you can. And uh, I do what I normally do. So I come back home, you know, talking the whole way we should start a con, we should start a con. I'm going to do all this, I'm going to do all this, I'm going to do all this. And then I pass it all to my wife. Um, so my wife basically runs DerbyCon now, for lack of a better term. I don't really do much except for uh, the speaker approvals. And we actually had a meeting, uh, was it yesterday or day before yesterday? And to go through call for papers, you know, we had like, I don't know, something like 100 and some submissions. Probably would take like an hour or two. It took like eight hours, and we didn't even go through the call for paper submissions. It was just us going ADD and talking about a whole bunch of weird stuff. So we're getting there. Anyways, if you don't know, I'm uh, one of the sexiest men alive um, that is not Photoshopped. If you haven't seen that, by the way, uh, it's, it's funny. I was on uh, the Katie Kirk show, and uh, uh, the guy that plays in Sherlock, uh, his last name's Cumberpatch or something like that. Uh, good show, by the way. Um, he uh, was coming up next, and so it said, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive, and then they removed the next piece, and then, oh, of course, everyone, all my friends on Twitter found that, and so, uh, but I'm keeping it. I like it. I like it. I think, it, I think it's accurate. <clears throat> but what's interesting about, I guess, this right here, um, when I was on the Katie Kirk show, is it, it kind of plays home to the social engineering side. When we do social engineering, we go into an organization, we break into it, the sophistication level that you need really doesn't need to be crazy, right? Because all of the users are vulnerabilities. And when you go after an organization, you target them, if you have something that's somewhat believable, or even like a little tiny bit, or even not believable at all, they'll usually do whatever you want them to do. Like salespeople, you can get to do whatever you want to. Like you can be like, hey, can you download this piece of malware and run it for me because I want to compromise your computer? And they're like, yeah, but can I still get your sale? I'll be like, well, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll buy your product if you do that. Like, okay, cool. You know, obviously exaggerated, but um, you know, very similar to what you can do. And what we're seeing now, is traditional education awareness that we're used to, like uh, online CBTs and you know, uh, targeted spear phishing to test education awareness, isn't as effective anymore. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the blog post that I did, but we, we researched a, a group out of Nigeria. And Nigerian scams are usually like you know, misspelled words and stuff that we're usually taught, right? Well, this group was actually sophisticated. They had like 30 to 40 people working in this, basically it was a full-fledged company with different tiers of support. And they were targeting organizations all across, um, you know, all across Ohio. We um, had cases in Florida, California, pretty much all around targeting basically the Fortune 1000 list and going down. So if you're over a billion or more, they're going after you. And what they were doing, which was uh, really sophisticated, is they were compromising your partners. So they would go after your partners that you already have established relationships with and compromise their emails. And once they compromised the emails, they would start sending um, you know, messages to the finance department requesting refunds or you know, um, you know, lines of credit from the company or product or whatever. And so they'd start the communication from a trusted email address from the partners. And then from there, they'd switch over to a different email address that was very similar so that it you know, didn't arouse any suspicion on the vendor side. And these companies were getting hit. I mean, I'm talking upwards of millions of dollars um, that these companies were wire transferring out in order to um, you know, um, get all this wire fraud going on. 
So the sophistication that we're seeing out there, I mean, compromising trusted third parties or going after organizations that um, you, know, you would trust in nature or making something very similar. There was um, ones where they didn't compromise a vendor, but they just made a domain name that was very similar and started targeting them. And you can tell like, um, it's a tiered support because in the event that the, the um, emails weren't working and they needed phone calls, they had a tier for, uh, for targeting people via um, phone phishing. So they'd actually call you up on the phone, perfectly good English accents, calling you up and talking to you, you know, conning you that way. So these things are getting really sophisticated right now. And so the traditional things that we do around education awareness, we can easily defeat. So what I'm going to do in this presentation today is just walk you through what we're taught today, I guess, in education awareness and really where we need to kind of move to, um, both as attackers in order to test, as well as on the defense side in order to protect against these types of attacks. And these are really difficult because you literally have to you know, change our dynamics of how we're training people today. And before we start, I want to show, um, has anybody seen the Katie Kirk interview I did with the, the lady that I, I compromised? If you haven't, I'm going to show you in a second. I feel really bad about it every time I show it, but keep showing it. yeah, I keep showing it. <laughs> the reason I want to show this is because targeting one person is, is relatively difficult. Okay, if I'm going after Bob, I have to know everything about Bob in order for me to target Bob. I need to know everything about his life. I need to know what he does. I need to know how I'm going to craft my attack. And then I'm going to go after Bob. Now, if I mess up targeting Bob, what happens? He, now he's on heightened alert, right? Now I have to try to figure out other ways around his heightened alert sense. So in this case, I targeted an individual, and obviously I had permission to do this and everything. Um, I targeted an individual, and you'll see how easy it is just to target one person um, to go after. Now think about this in a much larger scale when you're targeting a corporation or a company. Right? I'm going after a company that has thousands of employees or a few hundred employees. Here's where it starts to get really easy because you have multiple attack I mess up on one, okay, whatever, I'll just go to another one, or I'll go to another one, another one, another one, or a different department, or you know, a different organization, or a partner, anything I want to to go after somebody. So here's, just, here's a quick one, and it's only like, it's only like uh, three minutes. Can you hear that? That's the last thing you want to say to somebody, by the way. <laughs> It's really on my mind. I'm very concerned about it. I, I feel like all of my antivirus software is up to date. I've taken a lot of precautions. I have a computer consultant who comes into my home to check on these things. And so I really feel strongly that, that we have done everything that's possible to try and protect my, myself and my daughters. So, so interesting enough about this piece right here, she actually hires a computer consultant to come to her house and lock her machine down. That's way above anything that I've ever seen you know, actually happening out there. So she would be... Well, you know, top 5%, you'll see that in a second, but top 5% of what I would say is the best out there. It's something that's really worrisome for me. Well, that, that's very impressive because you seem like you're extremely ahead of the curve. So we decided to put David to the test to see if your comfort level with your security is actually warranted. Tell us what happened. How did you do when we gave you the challenge of hacking? By the way. I'm just excited right now. I just, <laughs> I'm like, trust me, you put me to the test. Stephanie's computer. So, you know, Stephanie, I would say, was actually one of the, the top 5% of what I would say is being most secure. Um, you know, everything up to date, really locked down, all of those good things. And um, so I literally had plugged in, opened my computer up, and less than 10 minutes or so, had a fully designed uh, website that looked real in every way and should perform like a website that you would visit every single day. And I sent an email out, and uh, as soon as I sent the email out, it looks very believable in every way. Uh, she clicked the link, um, and then from there, again, less than 10 minutes of set up time and hacking and all that stuff, I had full access uh, to her computer, uh, her webcam, got around all of her antivirus, everything completely. You are kidding me. It gets worse. Yeah. So, it gets so much worse. This is when I start to get really upset. Like. Tell us all my thoughts that you were able to see. Well, the first thing we did is we, we enabled her. Oh my God, uh, that's my. We enabled her webcam. <laughs> everything that was going on in her house, everything from her daughter uh, working on her computer uh, to Stephanie actually walking through the house itself. Uh, we actually enabled the audio as well, so we could actually hear everything that was going on at the same time. So we to I'm not going to keep going. I can't look anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, that was good. Um, and you know, the, the funny part was it took me 10 minutes to set it up. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. On, I was actually, I was on a pen test in uh, New York and um, you know, I got a call saying, hey, can you be on the Katie show in like two days? I'm like, sure. I'm like, what do you want me to talk about? She's like, well, can you hack into someone's computer? I'm like, well, if you like, you know, give them, give them permission, I'm just not gonna hack into anybody's computer. I'm like, can I hack into Katie's? And she's like, no, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that would've been cool. But um, 
so, so you know, we set this up and everything, and um, you know, she didn't know what was going on. She knew that something was going to happen. So I, I just you know, looked around and I started. Uh, I knew her name. That's all I knew. Um, and I started identifying, you know, what she did every day. I looked on her social media. I looked at, you know, um, home address, and then from there I pulled records. And I started looking at, you know, basically doing all the stuff just to kind of do my open source intelligence. And then from there. I just set up something that she would use every day, just a website that she visited, or you can tell that she made orders from. And then, you know, I set it up and you know sent her a couple of targeted emails, and she clicked on it, and you know, compromised her computer, and that was it. So that's targeting one person. Think about thousands of people, right? And that's where we have a problem right now, is because, like, listen, I can break into the perimeter, but it's a lot of work. Like for me to go in and find a SQL injection flaw and to comb your web applications and comb your external presence and do the proper OSINT, it takes a lot of time and effort. And believe me, that, that part's important too. But in order for me to go and build a pretext and go after an organization and con somebody, it only takes a little while. I mean, if I want to do a really sophisticated one, you're talking maybe a day to build something really cool. And if you're talking about maybe something that, that will get picked up, maybe not, you're talking maybe a couple hours. So it's really easy to get into this stuff. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, is just education awareness in general, what we're taught, uh, destroying what we're taught. And then uh, I'm going to be releasing a new version of the Social Engineer Toolkit today. Uh, I've been working on this version for literally six months, um, you know, putting it up there. And uh, so there's a lot of new stuff going out. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Feedback. What'd you do? <laughs> it's not muted. It's not, okay, I'm muting it now. Is it working? So the new version has a lot of new um, attack vectors. I've improved on a lot of the other ones. Um, and you'll see a lot of that uh, today when we kind of go through some of the feature sets. So this is how we hack today, all right? Um, and this is how we target our organization. This is what we're taught to do. So when we do our targeted spear phishing attacks for an organization, whether you're a pen tester or you're using some sort of third party service or you're doing that on your own, we typically send what, hundreds of emails that do a sample size, right? Or thousands of emails to do a sample size. So we select, let's just say, you know, 5,000 people out of our 30,000 user population, or people that have gone through the education awareness program. And then from there, we send all of our um, emails to them just to understand how many people click through it. Does that sound about right? And then from there, once we understand how many people click through it, we have a percentage. And if that percentage goes down, we think we're doing better. Right? So that's not what we're going to do as an attacker. We're not going to use misspellings. We're not going to grab percentages and metrics to see how many people uh, click on us. We're going to do something a little bit different. What we do is we target somebody. Did I do something wrong? I didn't bump anything, I don't think. All right. So what we typically do is um, we target a small number of people. Like I'm talking maybe three to four people. And the reason we do that is why? Sound off alerts, right? So the, the higher number of people you target, the higher probability you have of being detected. And when that happens, obviously, if you get detected, then it's hard for us to actually go back and start doing our fish. So we really want to try to, I don't know what's going on there. Here, let me try to turn. So even if I turn this off, it's still. Someone did something bad. So we target a, no, a small number of people. If I target like three or four people, uh, you usually don't have an issue going after an organization. And so if I customize it to the company itself too, I mean, it makes it even better. Like for example, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the phone phishing side, but you know, we, when we go after a company, we look at like their press release, their, new, um, their news releases, um, their PR departments, uh, anything that they're doing in the news, because those are valuable pieces of information that I can use. Like for example, just by sending, like uh, we own like a whole bunch of fake news media domains. And uh, just by sending uh, it from a new news media domain to a company's PR place, and so th someone sends an email back, what happens? Let me know. What, what do you get from that email? How they structure their email themselves, like so the signature, the title, the colors, the phone number structure, everything that you need in order to build a successful fish. So just by doing something st simple like that, now you have a template to go off of. So when you start doing stuff like that, oh, I lost it, didn't I? <laughs> test, test. I'll just, I'll just yell. Uh, test, test. So, you know, I'll, I'll usually do a lot of things like that just by, just by getting enough information to customize my attack, all right? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Now, in uh, today's SE, uh, SE training, um, we have, like, online CBT trainings that we have to do once a year. So I was the chief security officer for a Fortune 1000 company, right? I had our online CBT. I literally just clicked next, 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 finish. I didn't want to listen to that stuff. It was horrible. Why would we do that to our, our users if we're not going to even do it ourselves? So the once a year training stuff do, does absolutely no good when it comes to what we're doing. Even if it's uh, intuitive or entertaining, you got to remind people how to do things. Like, uh, for example, when you join a company, and you, let's just say you start from a new, or, a new organization, 
do you know the basic principles and things that you have to follow as far as day-to-day -day activity, like where the lunchroom's at, or you know how to wire, you know how to how to get paid, or your benefits, or things like that? Do they send you open enrollment stuff throughout the whole year, or things that, to kind of keep you posted of what's going on in the company? Those are the same types of things that we have to do in security, but you know that's what we always typically see. And you know, in order to do that, the the, the training all year long is is a key concept for me. I mean, um, let, let's just say the target breach, for example, right? Sending emails out to individuals saying, hey, you know, this was compromised, this is the type of stuff that you'd have to worry about, relating it back to them is really impersonable. Or how to secure your own home wireless, or you know, how to protect your kids on Facebook. Things that people relate to, because at the end of the day, people do not care about the company data. Like, they just don't, right? They only care about their data. So if you ask somebody for a social security number, or ask somebody for you know, a person, their personal, personal information, they get really upset. Like uh, we were doing a fish about a month ago, and uh, this lady was giving us everything. I mean, I'm talking like, you know, like passwords and everything else. As soon as we asked her for uh, her birth date, she got so mad and she hung up the phone. She's like, I don't think you're who you say you are and click and hang, hung up the phone. I'm like, you just gave us everything. Like, I have passwords for everything. I have, I have your entire internal structure. You were typing commands in for me. I, I have access to your box. I actually have your birthday, by the way, because you have it on your desktop. And, and as soon as I ask you for your birth date, you get mad. So people don't care about those things. Um, it's just really trying to relate to them in a personal way that starts to change security in a different way. Hi. You're doing a great job. Thanks. <laughs> we have not found the problem. <laughs> Just unplug everything until it works. <laughs> um, SDs via, via equipment drops. Now, here's what I never understood. Uh, we still send USB thumb drives to people, expecting them to plug them in, and then all of a sudden, you know, we get shells and stuff. We disabled auto run on Windows Vista by default. So we don't have auto run enabled in any case on any of our, our, I guess, modern ones. I guess if you're still using Windows XP, it might still be relevant. But most people don't plug in USB thumb drives unless you do something cool. So as an example, my favorite uh, on, on equipment drop, he's all right, he's okay, he's fine, he's, he recovered fully. Um, you can be whoever you want to. So send a package from somebody inside the company that makes it with the letterhead, ah. Send it from somebody inside the company or a partner that they know and make it a nice little letterhead with a nice little letter and sign it with the, the person's fake name or do OSINT on somebody. I mean, there's so much information on LinkedIn. You can be like anybody you want to be because they have, for example, if I want to profile a company, okay, let's just say I'm going after Trusted Tech. You know, the per, people that work at Trusted Tech probably like to post what they do, right? So hey, we just implemented a you know, ArcSight implementation. We're still at the early concepts of it, but I'm really getting a lot of experience in ArcSight. Thank you. Now I know you have a very immature monitoring detection program. Or hey, you know, hey, we're, we're implementing Symantec, or we have Symantec, or we have this, we do this, we do this. We list all the technologies for a corporation. So me understanding that is a good way for me to get around it before I send the hardware attacks, or whatever I'm gonna use. So be anybody you want to, just send a package just from inside the company with a letterhead on it from somebody inside the company saying, hey, can you download these or do whatever you want to? They'll do whatever you want. Like you can put instructions on there too. Like double click malware.exe and open it up and disable your antivirus first because it's probably gonna flag up, you know? And then from there, just open it up and it's good because it's on a letterhead from somebody inside the company. I'm sure it's legit. That stuff's easy. That's my favorite. Like, equipment drops are by far my favorite one to do because you can get people to do whatever they want to. It's not like I have to craft a, a meticulous website or anything like that. I literally can just take a USB. I don't put auto run on it. Just put it and put an executable on the root of the drive and then have somebody double click it. That's all you need to do. That's the easiest thing for me to get shell into an, an organization is through that versus something I have to spend time on, which is phishing. Um, in-person uh, SEs. These are my favorites. Uh, a lot of impersonization of delivery people, been done. Impersonating employees, been done. Piggybacking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then those are still effective ways. But the thing that, that we do, I guess, as attackers is we over uh, complexify things. I know it's not a word. I just wanted to kind of throw it in there. Um, for me, when I go in, I like to make it easy, make it simple. Because what happens when you do these overly complex attacks is you start to run into issues where it doesn't work because it's so like, overly complex. Like people are like, wait a minute, our FedEx guy is Bob, and you know, Bob comes in here every single day. Why am I impersonating him or our UPS guy or our postal guy? You know, or when you go in and you start impersonating employees, they're like, hey, I've never seen you here before. You know, let me see your badge, and the badge is of course fake and everything else. So why not just do simple stuff? Like um, one of my favorite ones, we were doing an um, uh, in-person SE, and uh, we, uh, we were doing a medical facility, um, an actual hospital. And the hospital was going through construction. I didn't have a hard hat or anything. I was literally in a business suit, okay? I'm like, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, you know, collared shirt and some slacks on. 
And I had, uh, in my car, I had a bug detector because I was just doing some sweeps uh, for bugs um, and another customer. So I had this little device that looks kind of like a little handheld. It makes noises and things and beeps. And uh, I was walking in the hospital just to kind of do recon to find out where I wanted to get to. And one of the main um, things was getting, um, you know, um, electronic health records or any type of um, hard, hard, uh, hard uh, health records, uh, normal uh, health records. And so we, I, I started walking by and I see this big sign. It's like this big room that says, do not enter, personnel only, medical records inside, sensitive secret, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, that's where I need to go. I need to get in there somehow. So I'm like, but I'm already here. And I'm like, well, whatever. So I knock on the door. And I said, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm from the energy company. Um, can I, I'm seeing some weird fluctuations. Of power. By the way, I know nothing about power. I mean, nothing. I, and if, some, if, if the lady was like, oh, you know, you know about power? Me too, my husband. So I'd be like, oh, crap. You know, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But um, so I knock on the door a little bit. And, and she's like, oh, yeah, come on in. I'm seeing power fluctuations. And I start, I don't, I don't think you can even like measure electricity with an antenna. But um, <laughs> so I'm in there and I'm like, you know, bleep, bleep, bleep. You know, and she's like going and she goes and does her own thing. I'm like, oh, it's going to take me about 15, 20 minutes. You know, I just got to test all these, these lines and everything. And bleep, bleep, you know, I'm hitting the button and everything. I'm like, oh, this is, ba this is bad. And so she's, she's, and then I start talking about computer stuff. And she's like, I don't want to hear you. And so she walks away. And so she walks away. And I'm basically unattended alone in this, this medical record area. And so I plant into um, a Tinsy device in one of the um, computers, grabs me a shell out of the network into the, the, to the medical record area. And then I'm also, I see this like huge stack of medical records. So I have this like small backpack. And I'm like, I can't fit it in there. So I'm just like, oh, whatever. So I put my backpack on and I just carry the medical records out like this. No problems. So we don't need to do stuff that's sophisticated. Just like spur of the moment, you can just do whatever you want to because people believe people. Until you violate somebody's trust, like something that's weird, they're not going to care. Like you don't have to be nervous or anything. You can just walk up to somebody and be like, hey, I need to steal all those electronic medical records. As long as that's not weird to that person, you're cool, right? So just do things that are simple. And that's, that's the problem we run into in, in real world SCs. That's, that's where the burglars are going to do. They're going to do things that are simple. They're going to blend in. They're not going to do sophisticated attacks. They're not going to sit there and lockpick doors and you know, evade security camera systems and stuff like that. They're literally just going to walk into the building as a normal person and do whatever they want to because that's how it works. So here's what we teach our users. Um, phones. Don't provide sensitive information, right? And, and it doesn't work because they, as long as you don't, again, touch social security numbers and birth dates, you're fine. Check the caller ID and look for suspicious activity. Um, phone phishing is my favorite. Um, this is a funny story. Um, we were doing a pen test for a company, a manufacturing company. They just celebrated their 100-year anniversary. So, you know, real big deal for this company. And it was all over the media, all over the news and everything. And they were really excited about it. And um, so when they were doing this, you know, I, I saw all of this news. And I'm like, hey, that's a perfect pretext. You know, they're really excited about this 100-year anniversary. We should go and probably target them that way. So we went to their website, the news, news organization, and we downloaded um, all their media criteria, and they had this PDF document that was uh, uh, to the, you know, like a release to the outside world, right? What's great about the PDF document is now I know the exact format that they use for their PDFs. So everybody believes it, right? It looks legit, it looks good. You might think, well, he's going to use a malicious PDF and send it out, and I didn't do that at all. So what I did is I sent an email to the PR um, folks. They sent an email back to us. I'm like, hey, I'm interested in doing a story for on you to um, you know, talk about your 100-year anniversary. This is so great. I'm so excited, blah, blah, blah. And I could have used them as an attack avenue, but I wanted to kind of expand a little bit and start targeting more of their intellectual property uh, manufacturing company, their, how they do their process builds and their manufacturing process and everything is what I, was wa want, uh, what I wanted to go after. Um, so I was going after um, specific key engineers um, in the organization. So what I did is I um, made a document that looked just like theirs. And uh, you know, same format and everything. It was a PDF, 100% legit PDF, no malicious code in it, nothing, right? And then from there, um, I sent an email out to these targeted individuals saying, hey, we're so excited about this 100-year anniversary. We're offering 100 free iPhones uh, for the first 100 people in our, as, an as an employee appreciation. Just go to this website, register, you know, and then all of a sudden you'll get a, a free iPhone. And so I sent it to four people, okay, targeting them, four. And I sent it to him, and, I, and it came back, and I got shells, you know, immediately coming in, and there your credentials and everything. Like, like, in, like, as soon as I hit send, I had shells coming in. It's like people like rolled on that. But the funny part was, it spiraled out of control. So those four people were like, "Oh my gosh, you're giving away free iPhones! I got mine." So I'm gonna send it to all my buddies in the company, seeing if they got it too. So we started getting a whole bunch of shells going back, and I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa!" So it started blowing out of control. The whole company was like going to this thing, and people were emailing us, and we we're actually troubleshooting. Um, so like the one lady is like, I can't get to the site. I mean, it's getting a weird error. I'm like, oh, you know, you need to do this and this. She's like, okay, I got it now. Thanks, you know. And and so <laughs> now now one thing actually happened uh, that I felt really bad about. Um, one of the ladies said, you know, I've been really going through a tough time and everything, and my life has just been horrible. My daughter's in the hospital. You know, um, this iPhone I'm going to give her as a birthday present. It's going to mean the world to her. And I'm like, I feel like the most horrible. So I bought her an iPhone, by the way, just throwing that out there. But <laughs> I'm like. 
I'm not going to even expense it. You can have it. It's just I'm, I'm not that horrible person. You know, I may, it may look like I'm from the KD interview, but I'm really a good person. And, and um, so one thing, though, I ran into that um, that, was, that was interesting is um, when we had access to the computers, um, they, they had um, limited user accounts, right? So they weren't running as administrator. And the problem with that is that, you know, post-exploitation-wise, um, it's hard to pivot if you don't have administrative level access. Now, when I say it's hard to pivot, it just takes more time for us. And what happens around 4 or 5 o'clock at, at night? People go home, right? They you know, close a laptop lid or they go home and so you start losing, so shells are dropping. We're like, oh no, what are we going to do? So what we did is um, we spoofed our phone number coming from the IT help desk to this individual we compromised. Let's call him Bob. And I say, hey, Bob, this is so-and-so from the IT help desk. Just want to let you know that we compromised your, com or, um, your computer's compromised. This, this iPhone thing is totally fake. It was a scam. You know, you really don't, um, you, you know, this is a total of BS and everything. He's like, he's like, man, I knew it. My company sucks. I hate them. I knew they wouldn't do that. I'm like, but, Bob, just so you know, we uh, monitor or we record our calls for quality purposes. Uh, we were recording the call at the time. Um, and uh, we're like, listen, you know, Bob, we'll take care of it. You know, there's just some malware on your computer. We've got to fix it and everything. So if you notice your computer kind of moving around, I mean, just leave it alone. It's us, you know, trying to fix it. He's like, okay, cool. So I hang up the phone. I spoof my phone number coming from Bob to the IT help desk. And I'm like, hey, this is Bob from, from so-and-so. I just went and I, I'm getting this weird kernel 0732 memory address bar terminated office something. I don't know what, I, what this is. I, I could barely click on my laptop and even turn it on. So can you help me out? And he's like, well, can you click on this and do this? I'm like, dude, I don't even know how to get to the start menu. I don't know what that is. I'm like, can you just I'm remote on my computer and figure out what's going on? So then they remote into the computer, and what happens then? You get your Kerberos token, and then boom, your administrator elevated, and then you have full access into the environment post-exploitation. Now it's trivial. So, you know, that's just some fun stuff you can do messing around, right? And that's, you know, the, sp uh, the phone uh, spoofing on that makes it a lot easier to do that type of stuff. Um, hardware, you know, we already talked about this, but don't plug it in. Make sure you verify where it comes from. Scan with antivirus. You know, hardware drops, again, for me, are definitely the easiest way to get in. Uh, users, this is my favorite, okay? So spear phishing to me is, is kind of, is really cool. It's like, it's like finding a new zero day because you're literally creating a fantasy that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but you need to make it believable to that person. So you're creating this whole fantasy land. That's the cool part. It's like when you find that first zero day, you know, you're like, whoa, I have a zero day here. And then it's like really not a zero day because the crash doesn't, you know, you, anyways. Um, but then you find one and it's cool. And, but in this one, you're building your whole, whole ba you know, complete fantasy. You're like basically making something that's going to be not believable whatsoever to anybody else except for the person you're targeting. And that's when it gets fun. So our users are taught to hover, which I'm going to show you how to defeat the hover here in a second. Um, check the domain name, suspicious activity. Again, we'll defeat all that uh, here in a little bit. My favorites are those. So let's talk about defeating your technology. We implement certain things in our environments, right? Like certain pieces of, of technology that are like APT prevention or, you know, zero day detection or um, antivirus or application whitelisting. And by the way, I still don't understand application whitelisting. Does any, anybody here understand application whitelisting? Because as an attacker, right, um, this is something I never understood. And I said it when application whitelisting came, I'm like, it doesn't do anything different for us. But anyways, so if I'm an attacker, right, and I'm going after your organization, I'm going to compromise it. And I'm going after your user population. Where's your, your, where's your application what is going to be installed at? The user population, right? So it's in the user population, and I need to go and I need to attack a user. So I'm going to attack them in a way that compromises them via something that they have on their computer, right? Like IE, Adobe, Java, et cetera, et cetera. Let me ask you a question. When I, when I compromise those specific processes, what am I running under? A whitelisted application. I don't, I'm like, so I go into customers that have application whitelisting. I'm like, so I'm like, da -da 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 -da, I'm getting access to everything. I got, and, then, and then I'm telling them everything I did, and they're like, well, did our application whitelisting stop you? I'm like, oh, you, you had application whitelisting? I mean, yeah, we, we had to do some really cool shit to get around it. I just, I mean, I had no idea it was there. So, you know, there's certain technologies that we have, but we have to defeat these in order to do so social engineering and get access to things, right? Because we're putting two-factor on our outside. We're putting things to, to protect um, access. And one of my favorites um, is two-factor authentication and implementation of those. Um, and no one raised their hand when I asked this, but has anybody ever used phone factor? Um, what's interesting with phone factor is you basically put the error back into the human. You've destroyed anything that we've taught around two-factor authentication, and you gave it back to the person to error. So with RSA tokens, whether, you know, everybody kind of has a negative connotation out of the RSA tokens, but someone had to actually take that code and put it into a system to get access to it, right? With phone factor, my favorite one is uh, the last four pen tests we've been on. So four pen tests that had phone factor. We compromise credentials, right? We log into, let's just say, OWA or VPN. And what happens is phone factor prompts up and says, we're sending a text message or we're calling you or whatever um, to let you know that, um, that, that, to see, to verify who you are and make sure that you know, you're logging in properly. Now what's gonna happen, so what happens on the end user screen that we compromise is they get a text message, okay? A text message says, do you want to allow access in, yes or no? What are they gonna do every single time? Yes, every single time. 
I have not found a company that hasn't hit yes when we do phone factor. They hit yes every single time. So there goes your two factor, right? But we have to defeat your other technology to get around. We have to get around your APT prevention tools. You have to get rid of, uh, around your next generation firewalls. We have to get around all this stuff. And so what I'm gonna show you here is the, the new version of the social engineer toolkit. Now, you might have seen this before, and this, is a, this has been in here for a long time. This new version is really slick. Um, so the Java applet attack method uh, is, is kind of the flagship, I guess, of the, of the toolkit, right? It's the, what everybody uses a lot of times to compromise it. And so in this case, um, the new version of set, it finds, a it's, it actually does predictive analysis of how e um, the best way to actually compromise the actual computer. So it'll say, okay, you're running Windows 7, I'm gonna build a profile off of what you have installed on the machine and I'm gonna compromise it using the best known method for success and if that fails, I'm gonna try other methods. And so it continues to try different methods of exploitability to gain access to yourself and everything's done, um, so it's really kinda nasty. Um, it, every time it generates a Java applet, it's a dynamic cipher key with AES-256 encryption and then that's um, changed uh, polymorphically every single time so it, it looks different um, every single time any type of communications are going out, so it looks legit. Um, and it gets around a lot of stuff because we're using things that are already whitelisted as far as application whitelisting. We're not actually writing anything to disk, it's all memory. Um, and we're not actually using any type of exploit. Just if you have Java installed, you're, you're, you're screwed. Which is the case anyway, if you have Java installed. But, um. So we're gonna launch the Social Engineer Toolkit. Now in the new version six, uh, what I added is if you're um, using Kali, if, is everybody familiar with the Bleeding Edge repos in Kali? If you're not, um, the Bleeding Edge repo is really slick. Um, you make a, a configuration change and it allows you to get daily updates versus like what they actually put in the packages, which could be month or weeks or whatever it ends up being. So you get daily updates of like all your core tools, like Metasploit, Set, Aircrack, uh, ReconNG, all of them go automatically packaged for you automatically. So the new version automatically check to see if you're using Kali. If you're using Kali, it checks to see if you're using the Bleeding Edge repos. And if you're not, it'll prompt you to say, do you want to install the Bleeding Edge repos and it'll automatically configure the Bleeding Edge repos for you. So just a new another little, little thing that I added into uh, Set. So we're gonna to go to the social engineering attacks, we're gonna to go to the website attack vectors, which is number two. And then we're gonna to go to the uh, Java applet attack method, which is number one. We're gonna clone a website. And we're, gonna not, we're not gonna use NAT or port forwarding because we're just doing it local here. Let me grab my IP address real quick. And what um, Java introduced recently was, uh, I think it was Java, it was like update, update 39 or something like that they disallow self-signed um, Java applets. Now, that's not a big deal for us. Uh, what you need to do is just register yourself as doing business as, and you can register yourself doing business as is anything. Like uh, doing business as I'm secure or this is a secure applet, please click it. Doing business as this is verified and secure. Whatever you wanna be doing business as, you can do it as, right? So register a doing business as, which costs you I think like 10 bucks or something like that. Um, so you got a doing business as, and then you just go and buy a code signing certificate. It can be whatever you want to. And we're seeing um, attackers out there using legitimate code signing certificates. That's what everybody's using now. So just go and get a, get a code signing cert. It's, two, it, it's literally, you know, the 10 bucks that you spent for there and then the 200 bucks for a two year code signing cert. And now you have a legit, a legitly signed code signing cert with whatever you want it to be. Like a lot of times we'll actually just buy, like doing business as the company name, you know, this is secure. You know, and then so we go out and we buy a code signing cert that it's all good and legit. So just go buy a legit cert. It's easy to do. It takes you about a week or so. Just to make sure you give your, build yourself a week to actually go through the verification process. But really easy to use. I use it all the time. I'm going to use my own applet that's built in. Now in the new version of set, I actually help you build it too. If you want to generate your, it'll actually generate your own um, request. You submit it and it comes back and then it uh, imports that code signing cert into set from, from there on out. So that's new too. And I'll just clone trust a sec as an example. All right, so we clone the website. It's automatically going to import the website, write all its bad stuff, going to get around antivirus. It's going to do injection. Now, we can fly over um, HTTP and HTTPS using Metasploit. Um, and what's interesting, if you didn't know this or not, um, most uh, proxies actually block the default uh, Metasploit payload in the second stage coming um, back. Because what happens with the reverse HTTP and HTTPS proxy um, is it actually goes out and pulls a PE file or a binary. So it actually calls out you know, HTTP and HTTPS and it pulls a binary back, which most content filters don't like. But you can actually go into the second config. If you go into the second config here, I'll show you real quick. And if you can turn, um, uh, enable stage, there it is. Um, you can turn stage encoding to on, and then basically it'll create a polymorphic um, 
blob that it'll just download it. That, it'll download it that way versus actually using it um, and downloading a binary. So that gets around most um, content filters and things like that that you have out there. But anyways, we have everything set up here. We're going to go to the IP address. I think it's just me. So what am I, 134, 134, 141. Now I register a domain name that would look similar in every way. I mean, I would do everything that looks legit, right? And I make it, you know, I'd send a spearfish out like I did with the, the one for the manufacturing company. And we can make, <laughs> I like go sound. You can make the name whatever you want to, right? And you can make the publisher whatever you want to because that's the doing business as. So you can do doing business as whatever, the, you can be verified publisher, you know, this publisher has been verified and secure, whatever you want to do. And then the name you can make whatever you want to. So make the publisher usually like, you know, somewhat uh, non-descriptive because you can reuse it on other attacks. But then on the name part, you can just make the name whatever you want to. It's just a uh, manifest update on the Java applet and you can make the name, you know, this is, this, you know, the company name, whatever you want to, trusted sec, whatever you want to do. And as soon as you hit run, and by the way, this, um, so AV Venters used to write signatures for my Java applet. So I spent about three months writing a polymorphic uh, uh, encrypted jar file that's completely dynamic. There's not one piece of static code in it whatsoever. So every, um, every 30 minutes, a new jar file gets uploaded to GitHub, and they finally gave up after like 12 attempts. So you don't have to worry about this getting picked up. Hit run. It's going to redirect back to the legitimate site, just like before. So now we're at the legitimate trustdesec.com site. And then over here, we have full access to the computer. And again, we're not actually running any type of exploit here. Um, this is just how Java sucks by design. So you have no worries, you, know, you don't have to worry about it getting patched or anything else, you just run it and you exploit them and you're fully, you, know, you can fully compromise them, which is great. Now the next one is my personal favorite. Um, this has been in set for a while, but I rewrote a large portion of it. It was originally introduced by um, a guy named M. Gent and White Sheep and, uh, from the Backtrack development team. And uh, this thing is really cool because it defeats um, our hover link, our, basically our, our entire hover. So when we hover over a link, we're taught that that's safe and secure, right? Well, this defeats that. So you can get around the hover and basically destroy education awareness. I actually feel bad about this one too. Huh? So we're going to go to the web jacking attack method, which is number five. We're going to go to the site cloner and enter my IP address in again. And I'm going to clone Gmail. Now, what's interesting about this attack, okay, is the way I would do this is I'd register a domain name that's very similar to the company name. Like, uh, for example, let's just say I was targeting trusted tech benefits. And I was going after the benefits um, side because it's close to open enrollment, things like that. And what I would do is I'd register like, benefits-trustedtech.com or trustedtech-benefits.com, something like that, or something that's similar to theirs, okay? Because I, I need a domain that's rel relatively similar for them to at least initially first click the link. And then from there, I design an entire website. And in the website, you can put, listen, make sure you hover over the link, make sure it's using SSL, and make sure it's not a phishing campaign, and it's going to the re legitimate account, it's going to this, e this, this thing. So they hover over it, and it's actually benefits.trustedtech.com. Would you believe it? Well, you're saying no now, but you... you <laughs> Some hogwash. You, you didn't know that before I got in here. <laughs> so obviously, I'd make this look a little bit nicer. I'd make the whole site nice and pretty. This is just a demo. But if you, what, what does that look like on the bottom left to you? I mean, can everybody see that? What's that say? Accounts dot Google dot com. Right. So that's safe, right? Obviously, you're looking at me really skeptical now. You're like, that's not, that's not right. You know, education awareness taught me I can do this, but. Um, so you, you look at this and it's accounts.google.com. So I'm hovering over this, right? And this works on IE, works on Firefox, works on Chrome, works on everything else. And this is the beauty, by the way, of browser flaws because these aren't considered browser flaws as far as the browser is concerned. It's not an exploit that I'm running or something like that. That's why I don't, you know, um, I used to be a lot into the exploit research and I still do some, um, it's fun. But, you know, when you find a, a browser flaw, like let's just say it's a memory corruption flaw or you have to do some, some crazy heat magic and stuff like that, what happens when you first use it the first time or you disclose it is what? It gets fixed, right? So instead of finding actual flaws in specific browsers, why not find features in browsers that they're never going to fix that we can use to, to exploit them forever? And so this one is interesting because it works on all of them and it's how it's designed. And by the way, it works if you have no script on too. There's no JavaScript involved in this or nothing, okay? It's really evil. So again, accounts.google.com. Now what, watch what happens really closely, okay? I'm going to click the link and my computer, my browser is physically going to be at accounts.google.com, okay? Everybody realize that? I'll be, my computer will be at accounts.google.com. So I'll be there. The website's going to load from the, the accounts.google.com servers. Then I'm going to do a quick switcheroo. Again, I would use a domain name that's similar to this to make it more believable. But watch what happens. I'm actually at accounts.google.com, right? Quick switcheroo. Let me see that. Quick switcheroo. Username. Password. 
Now over it redirects back to the legitimate site. And then over here, I'm not sure which one it is, but you see it here. We harvest the username and password. And so it completely defeats what we're taught for education awareness, right? That's a pretty nasty one, I think. So, but it works really well. And we use this all the time because it, you know, no one's going to pick up on that. They're not going to sit there and, and just stare at the domain as it's going through, especially if you register something similar to it. So it works out really well. So what we're going to do um, is play a little game, okay? I like to play a game because I like games and they're fun and active. So what we're going to do is going to give you multiple choice, A, B, C, and D. And you have to tell me which ones you would use in order to stop these attacks from happening. Okay, the first one we're going to do is a Java applet attack. So A, B, C, or D, which one would actually prevent this attack? You ready? All the above? Good, good call, sir. Good call. Good call. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, for reals, though. Um, a, B, C, or D. Disallow execution from temp. Disallow execution from all user profiles. Disallow regular users from execution of PowerShell. Um, D, remove Java or secure it if possible. All the above. Yes. So I don't know if you know this or not, but um, you actually have in group policy right now application whitelisting. All right, it's called app locker. You also have what are called software restriction policies. They're in group policy, you can configure them now, okay? What you can do is if you disallow execution from temp and all user profile, you're literally gonna stop about 80% of the malware because that's where most of them run at. So you just do that minor change. It's not gonna impact your users much unless they actually run executables from temp, but literally you're gonna stop a large portion of it. Now you're not gonna stop set because set doesn't run um, any executables. So it's, it's purely in memory. But I do use PowerShell for my injection technique, at least one of them. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but you can actually disallow PowerShell from executing for normal users. You can say normal users inside AppLocker, normal users cannot execute PowerShell. Do normal users ever need to access PowerShell? No, only administrators, right? So you can disallow normal execution from PowerShell and all of a sudden you've just disabled a large portion of the attack vectors in set. Now in the Java side, a lot of us can't remove Java in our corporations because, well, yeah, it's a whole nother story. Um, one, we probably don't even know how to uninstall it because the installer is so jacked up, but um, um, obviously I like Java a lot. Uh, but what you can do is you can put it in like a, um, like a Hyper-V instance or um, in a, um, an app virtualization pool. And what I've seen a lot of companies do is just whitelist applications that are allowed. So you know, if it's, it requires a Java to, to actually load and run, then you whitelist that and it's, just an, it's in its own app V farm. You've whitelisted only the applications you need and then you have a separate browser for people to do normal browsing on. It's not that big of a change and it works really well. So all of the above. Um, nothing's bulletproof. You can get around uh, software restriction policies in, um, in, in AppLocker, but it definitely helps out. Um, now here's a quick point of proof of concept I did on uh, the PowerShell injection stuff. Oh no, that was, uh, this is bypassing, um, this is bypassing uh, software restriction policies. This is um, the magic unicorn attack. This is where you do PowerShell injection. Um, it's all on GitHub, so if you want to check it out, uh, the source is open there, but it basically does injection um, into memory using Matthew Graber's attack, but it's a lot better. It works on uh, 64 and 32-bit, not better than Matthew Graber, but the attack's improved, so it works on 64 and 32-bit platforms. Now the web jacking is tough because it takes advantage of our human weaknesses, right? I mean, that literally is like destroying everything that we're taught. So what, what, what's gonna fix this one, A, B, C, or D? It's not D, <laughs> although it's kind of D. It's a little bit D, right, not really. Um, education awareness can help. I mean, the more your teacher uses, the more they can look for suspicious activity, like if they're you know, computers are doing weird things or they see the redirect for some reason, report it, understand that that's coming into the, the security team. Some technological controls might, might stop it. Like for example, um, one of my favorite ones um, is in content filtering um, software, like whether you're using blue code or scan safe or whatever it ends up being, they have something called uncategorized sites. And 99% in of your, your malicious sites that are sp uh, phishing are gonna come from those uncategorized sites. So if you just block those, you're literally going to have maybe like a 0.01% increase in sites that people are trying to get to and then you just whitelist them and you're fine. It doesn't make that much impact on the business and at the same time you're literally stopping like 99% of the websites out there. Now to get around it is trivial, right? All I need to do is submit my site to one of the content filtering um, you know, companies and we do it to all of them. So we do like all six of them or something. We have like six of them we send it to and then they basically categorize you as whatever it is. And it's funny because one of them, you can actually clone the company, the, the, the web content filtering company's own website and it'll, category, it'll actually categorize you as a content filtering company. It's like, I'm not gonna tell you which one, but I mean, it is like, we've been using that forever. It's like weird. I, I learned that from uh, Eric. So anyways, um, A, B, C, and D, or A, B, and C, sorry. Now some other things to ponder, um, education awareness is key, two-factor authentication, as long as you implement it right. 
Um, uncategorized sites, up-to-date software. I mean, when we still go into companies, we see MSO to 6.7, it's ridiculous. Um, least restriction is possible. Uh, has anybody used the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit or Emmet? If you haven't, write that down. It's like the coolest thing ever. It's free. It's from Microsoft. It literally stops um, almost all of the zero days that come out today and doesn't have a major impact on any of your applications and it's low hanging fruit. And it's like, you know, low, low, uh, low resource pool. Um, and it literally stops a large portion of the zero days. I don't think there's a zero day out there right now that stops it except for um, uh, Jared DeMott did a talk uh, recently on bypassing all of the Emmet uh, mitigation uh, techniques, but it makes a, the exploit much more difficult to do. In fact, uh, there was an exploit uh, released recently. It was an IE zero day, and uh, it actually looked for the Emmet DLL. It was the first exploit that actually looked for Emmet, and if it saw the Emmet DLL, it just stopped itself and didn't run. So that's pretty cool. Um, and really, it's, it's really, it's, it is kind of complex to install. I mean, like really complex. You literally have to double click the MSI and hit next, 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 use recommended settings and finish. Um, so it takes a lot of time and effort uh, to do. And it actually hooks into Active Directory, which is even, even crazier hard to do. Um, so, you know, it literally can stop a lot of that stuff. So, getting better. When I look at, at what we're doing today, I literally look, look at us as being like in the 1990s. See, a couple of people laugh. I'm not that old. And I, I feel like I'm getting old. But that hair is amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel like the attacks that we're doing haven't progressed at all. The USB drops, literally, we've been doing since 1990. The efficient campaigns with misspellings and stuff like that we've been doing since 1990. We have to focus on changing our dynamics because the attackers are doing a lot of different things that are more sophisticated. So we have to be more sophisticated too as we go along and do this because we're not going to get better as an industry. I'll tell you, so that company that I, I talked about um, doing that, that iPhone attack with, right? So that was the first year we did it. And this is, this is the third year we've been testing them. The third year we tested them, extremely difficult to get into. Like I'm talking like, I, I spooked my phone number coming from inside the company with HR to a person asking, hey, we had a crash in our HR system, blah, 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 and just need to verify a couple of pieces of information. She wouldn't do it. She's like, you need to physically come down here, walk downstairs to my desk and tell me to do it because I don't know who you are. And, I, and, and she's like, I'm not seeing you in, the, in our database. And I'm like, oh, it's this name. She's like, oh, okay, well, I see in the database, I still don't trust you. So, I mean, you get to that point and it can work. I mean, you're not trying to make your, your employees super paranoid, but you know, regular testing and actually going through and doing things that are proactive all the time make a huge difference. I mean, it really does. And what's funny, um, when you first go through a social engineering campaign that's legit, like a, a full-fledged one where you're going after people, people get pissed. I don't know if you've ever gone through one of those, but like it's a political like storm. Like, I mean, people are like, you're targeting me, I feel violated, you know, is he going to my home computer, you know? Are they People don't understand that, but you, if you at least do education awareness first and kind of like move yourself in a little bit and kind of explain what you're trying to do and then from there you start doing testing, it works really well. So for me personally, the most critical part of an information security program isn't compliance, it isn't vulnerability management, it isn't pen testing, it isn't anything, it's education awareness. For me, education awareness is like the foundation of building a security program. When I was at Diebold, I went into Diebold and um, you know, it was a very, I would say immature program, right? So the first thing I did is not what? Patch a MS-367 or patch a file or patch a web server. Although I did, um, anyways, that's a, long, a whole other story. Um, but you know, I didn't do all those things at first. I focused on education to the people. So getting buy off on from our executives and working with our company and getting a communication plan out. And what I found is that as soon as I invested in education awareness, things actually got better. Like I could do really crazy stuff like rehaul our entire network in like a week, which would normally take a normal company like a year to do. You know, I'm, I'm talking like production changes, like, hey, we're gonna go to, we're just gonna, we're just gonna up it to 10 characters today, 10 character passwords today across the whole company and see what happens, you know? And obviously we went through change control and all that other stuff. I don't wanna like, you know, get in trouble with the change control people, but, um, but literally you get stuff that works really fast. And so if you look at building a program, the first step is, is selling the program to your executive committee. I mean, by far you need your people to buy off on it. And then right now, we have such a valuable time right now to, to do this. Everybody's freaking out about Heartbleed and then the, the week after an IE zero day came out. Like everybody's come, I, I had a um, buddy that was the first time presenting to the board of directors in his company for security. And the guy interrupted him and said, hey, we're not doing enough in security. What do you need to be successful? And he's like, okay, I need some people. I need this and this, 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 and this. He's like, you got it. We're not capitalizing that enough. Use the media and stuff to do things like that to, to get the buy-off that we need from our community. We, we've never had a time in the industry right now where we've been so in the news around security threats coming from everywhere than we have today. So it's our own excuse if we don't get buy off in our security program. Step two, build a program. So start getting into how you're gonna you know, do, um, by the way, does anybody remember this? Has anybody, not rem never, has anybody not seen this before? Okay, good, okay, so I'm still in the younger phase, that's good. <laughs> kind of freaking out, I'm in my 30s now. But, um, but um, so you, you take this and you relate information to people, send emails out continuously, things like that. Um, podcasts are a fun one, you know, make it entertaining and fun as much as you can get away with. Obviously, don't throw F-bombs on your corporate podcast. 
I learned that the bad way. Um, <laughs> step three, test the program. Um, and this is when you can actually start testing. You know, start doing targeted attacks. See how effective you are. See what your technology controls are and how well they're working against the stuff. Focus on your users. And this is when you start to get to the education side. And then step four, just maintain. Keep it going better. Um, you know, keep it, keep it making, uh, keep making it easier. I mean, people start to understand when you do these type of things, why you're going to 10 character passwords or 12 character passwords or why you're implementing a certain piece of technology. It's not like security is now fighting them. It's more of like, hey, we're, they're trying to protect us, you know, in here. And they're also trying to help us at home. Like, I remember staying at, at uh, Diablo's one night. Someone came to my, uh, my, my de uh, desk and it was someone in the sales division and came up to me and was like, hey, listen, I, I don't know who else to go to. I got this virus on my computer. I'm like, no problem, dude. So I sat there and I sat there till two in the morning, um, you know, getting rid of the malware on his computer. And also, well, the two in the morning is me reversing and figuring out who they were and then from there doing other stuff because that was fun. But, um, but you know, fixing that uh, person's computer made a huge difference, and he's there spreading like, dude, the dude, you know, the the guy over at the security team just helped us out and did everything he possibly could to, to help us out. That makes a big difference in a company. So, anyways, just to walk through this um, and set um, some of the new features, and then we'll um, we'll wrap up. Um, the new version has a lot of new attack vectors. There's one that uh, a guy named Darko's created. Um, it does a, what's called a full screen attack vector, which um, if you don't know this or not, you can actually force your browser to go to full screen mode on the on the on the server side. So you can force your browser to go to full screen mode, which hides the URL bar, which means that you can basically start attacking people when they don't know what they're doing. Um, so that's another one um, that's now released in the new version. Um, a lot of new attack vectors, code enhancements. I think I literally coded like 13,000 lines of new code in this um, to get it going. Um, so there's some really cool stuff uh, in it that'll definitely help you out when you're doing these type of uh, attacks. But just a warning, this is a tool. You have to figure out who you're attacking. Just running through the commands that I did ain't gonna help you. Profile your company, target them in a way that you're gonna like. And then from there, you know, research your targets, do your proper OSINT. And that's it. I'm not going to get through the GPU stuff because I don't have enough time, but that's one of the new GPUs that I built. And um, yeah, so it cracks a 77 billion per second. So we get a 10 character password in less than nine seconds. Um, but anyways, that, I actually blew our circuit breaker on, uh, at the office. So we had to switch to a 40 amp circuit. Anybody have any questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.